like I know a thing. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a box you in, but I'm laying down, I want to know you, Lord, I used to think that I could box you in, but I'm laying down, I want to know you, Lord, I'm laying down, oh, out and you find me in the dust I say no amount of untruth can separate us I reach out and I reach out
Give me wind. 
Amy. Let's get it for Amy real quick. Hey, Amy. Hey, if you would go ahead and have a seat. If you are watching online, welcome online. We're glad you're here. My name's Brent, one of the pastors, and there are some things that are happening in life of our church that we wanted you to know about. If you are physically on campus this weekend, out in the lobby right after the service, there's going to be a booth there, and uh, Fresno Christian, uh, because Cross City is one of the partner churches, is going to be offering a priority enrollment, and that's kind of a big thing this year uh, for a couple of reasons, not only because my wife's the principal, uh, but also um, because um, there's some school districts right now that are looking like they're only going to be offering classes two days a week. And uh, the Fresno Christian will be offering classes for every student every day uh, this next week. And so we wanted you to know 
that maybe you've never felt the nudge for a private Christian education, but this year you just got nudged. And so if you have any questions about that, Amy will be in the lobby and she'd love to answer questions. And online, you're going to notice an email address. I think it's info at fresnochristian.com and then you'll get answered that way. Is that it? Did I do a okay job? Thank you. All right. Bye, Amy. Say bye, Amy. Bye. All right. Hey, um, there's a lot of things happening in the life of our church. Hopefully, you follow us on social media. If you haven't already, make sure that you do that. You'll notice last weekend uh, that we had uh, something special here on campus, and that was uh, baby bottles out in the lobby. And those are for the month of July. We are supporting life at Cross City through the Pregnancy Care Center. So if you want to, you can grab one of those bottles on the way out. And on the first weekend in August, return it, and we'll give all of those proceeds to the Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, We'd love to have you do that. If you're watching online, you can swing by uh, the frap house this next week, Monday through Friday, and some of the bottles will be there as well. Now, we continue to be blown away by how many people are watching online. We continue to have record numbers online. Many of you are here this weekend. But for those of you that have started coming physically on campus and you are new to the church, we wanted you to know there's a way for you to get connected on Thursday nights on the 23rd, which is actually my son's birthday. Happy early birthday, son. Uh, And on Thursday night, uh, we are going to be having something called Connect 4. You need to RSVP for it. But it's going to be a way for you to get connected into community even with your kids. And so for those of you that are on campus, in your bulletin, you'll notice a write-up on that and how you can get connected that way. Um, finally, uh, and, and lastly, for those of you that are watching online, uh, make sure that you're saying hello to your host and, and that you're being nice online, uh, and also that you uh, know that uh, you can participate not only with a connection card, uh, but you can also give online as well. And one of the ways you can do that is by texting CC Fresno to 77977, and that is going to be redirecting you to a secure website, uh, and, and it will continue to make it possible for the mission and the ministries of the church to go forward. Uh, I'll come up at the end of the service after Pastor David's message and I'll give you an opportunity to know what you can do physically on campus as well. We also want to acknowledge the fact that there are many that have been impacted negatively by the COVID impact. And so if you need assistance, you can email us assistance at mycrosscity.com and we'll contact you within the next 24 hours and we'll see how we can partner with you. Hey, we're going to transition now into a time of communion. For those of you that are watching online, hopefully you've got some bread and some juice that you've come prepared with. Here physically on your way in, you received a pre-wrapped set of communion cups and there's some wafer on top, juice below. You know, there's a lot of change that is going on in our world, but it is encouraging to know and comforting to know that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen, church? And even though we may be receiving communion in a cup uh, that's prepackaged, it still doesn't take away from the fact that our God loves us, he's with us, and he'll always be with us moving forward. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. So God, we love you so much. We're thankful, Jesus, that you lived a perfect life, a sinless life. You died on a cross, you bled real blood, and the story didn't end there. You were placed in a grave, and three days later, you defeated death, and you rose to new life. And in so doing, you proved that you were the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so we worship you. Everything that we're going to do today is all about you. Even Pastor David's message, where he's going to be moving from the 11th to the 12th chapter of Hebrews today, is all about you, Jesus, and the impact that you've had not only on our life, but on eternity. So when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we're remembering you, and we're so thankful that you lived a life of love so that we can have an eternal life with you forever. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we all pray. If this is your prayer, please say amen, amen.
morning. How many of you are cold? Kind of chilly. I'm chilly up here. It's 107 outside. I'm cold up here. Hey, thank you for being here today. Just are so grateful for your presence. Grateful for those of you that are watching online. I do have a little shadow for the first time in my life on my upper lip. And uh, it's kind of, my wife said I didn't have the guts to walk out on stage with it. And so I've won a bet and I will get that reward later. But uh, I won, okay? So I know it doesn't look great, but uh, I won the bet. So uh, I heard about a preacher who was in a farming community and he was having this big breakfast and he invited this uh, the elderly farmer that in, in the whole area to come and, and do the prayer over the breakfast. And this old farmer in his late 80s, he began to pray. He said, Lord, you know, I hate buttermilk. And the preacher was like, uh-oh, I shouldn't have asked this guy to pray. The farmer continued, Lord, I can't stand the taste of lard. And the preacher was shaking his head. This is a big mistake. I should have never had. This guy's lost it. And the farmer continued, Lord, you know I can't stand the taste of raw white flour. And the preacher was about to interrupt and start his own prayer. And the farmer continued and said, but Lord, when you mix them all together and you bake them up, I sure do love these fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up, he continued to pray that we don't like When life gets difficult, when we don't understand what you're doing, we just need to relax and wait until you're done mixing. And probably it'll be something a whole lot better than even these biscuits. And he said, amen. And the preacher right next to him said, amen. It was a great prayer. And you know, there's a lot of truth in that. Some of you right now, you're in God's mixing bowl. Some of you, there's some stuff going on in your life right now you're not real comfortable with. Some of you, everything's going great. You're, you're, you're in the biscuit stage. Everything's wonderful. But we're going to see that we need faith when things are great, when we're in the luxury faith, the biscuit stage, and when, when we're in the mixing bowl. We always need faith. It is essential. It is needed. It is a necessity. And for a lot of us, We're facing some tough times, some difficult times, the strange seasons. That's why I call this a a tough, sturdy faith. That's what we need today. We've been studying through Hebrews, and we've been this summer of faith, and we've been talking about all these great heroes, and they've many of them have experienced miracle after miracle after miracle. They have been rescued. They have been delivered. It's really amazing. The, the flames of fires, they, they've been quenched, they, they've escaped the sword, the, the mouths of lions are miraculously shut. I, I mean, just all kinds of great miracles of deliverance. And we get to this passage here, the very end of chapter 11, verse 36, and I got to tell you, there is a huge pivot. Brent alluded to it last week, where the Hebrew writer, instead of talking about deliverance, he starts talking about danger And he starts talking about death. What? This can't be in the hall of fame. This can't be part of the hall of faith. I just want to ask you today, what do you feel like when things do not go your way? What does it it seem like when, when, when it feels like faith has failed you? When God let us down. We're disappointed that he didn't deliver us the way we We believed that he would deliver us. We'd hoped for this, but we didn't get this. We got that. I want you to read with me. I'll read, but I want you to follow along in Hebrews 11, verse 36. It says, some face jeers. This is a big pivot. All these miraculous recoveries. Babies being brought back to life. We're pivoting. Some face jeers and flogging. I call these the no-names. While still others were chained, put in prison, Stoned, sawed in two, put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, mountains, caves, holes in the ground. They were all, listen, commended for their faith. Yet none of them, this is the every line here is I could preach for a week on the every line, and you know I have that ability. But it says, it says, 
that they were all coming to birth, yet none of them received what had been promised. What? I'll, I'll get to that. God planned something better for who? What does that, what's that, that, that word say? For who? That's me and you. I, I want to explain this today to you. God planned something better for you than he did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God planned something better for us so that only together with us, me and you, would they, all these Old Testament saints, be made perfect. And there really shouldn't be a chapter change, but the next verse in chapter 12, 1 says, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. All these heroes of the faith are up there, and they're watching us. And the Bible says we should throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles, and we should run with perseverance the race that's marked out before us. And I'll preach mostly on that next week. But we have all of these heroes we've looked at. And then Brent kind of talked about the lesser-known heroes, Rahab and Sarah and Barak and Jephthah and Gideon, and they're not as known as, well known as the others. But these we're looking at today, they're, they have no names. They're, they're, I call them the no names. We just read, they've been, they've been killed by the sword. They were sawed in half. And when you come to the end of this hall of faith, this incredible chapter, you're walking down these halls and you're expecting to see the next statue of the, of the, of the next uh, great hero or the next painting or something. But when you get to the end of the hall and you look, you're actually looking into a mirror and you're seeing a reflection of yourself. You may not know this or you may not believe this, but I've got great news for you. You and I are in the hall of faith. You and I, if you love Jesus and you follow Jesus, we are in the hall of faith. That last statue is a mirror and it, it is your reflection. How's your faith today? Some people have what I call fair weathered faith. When everything's great, man, they have no problem saying, praise the Lord, everything's fantastic, God is so good, right? Then we have the foul-weathered faith. That's when people, they call on the Lord only when they're in trouble. They never, they have zero, but when something goes wrong, boom, their first phone call is to the Lord. I remember after 9-11, I was the preacher here at this church. The week, the Sunday, the weekend after 9-11, our church was packed. And then that threat of terrorists kind of went away, and a few weeks later, the crowd kind of went back to our, our normal numbers. I call that a foul-weathered faith. And I, trust me, don't want any terrorist attack to ever happen again in this nation, but if it does, be ready, because this place will be packed if it does. Our attendance is down because, just let me rant a little bit, and give me a little grace here for a moment. Yes? No, th th thank you, thank you. Wasn't sure I was getting it. I think uh, the media is a big part of it. I think the government is a big part of it. I think that uh, we've been a little bit duped. I know, I know there is a, a virus out there, and I know it's serious, and I know it's deadly to some people. But I, 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 we've said, and we listen, we mean this with all of our heart. If you're not comfortable being here, we want you to stay home. We don't want you to be here and be uncomfortable. We want you to stay home and we want you to watch. But I really believe about 75% of everything that's going on now is political. And you know I am not here for politics. I gotta be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm staggered, stunned in two ways. I'm staggered by how many people are here today. And I'm a little staggered by how many people are not here today. Uh, I just believe that if you're young and if you're healthy, that this would be the place that you would want to run to. I, I've been, uh, I, I follow a lot of you on Facebook and I get to see your parties. <laughs> I, 
because you can't help yourself, can you? I mean, y'all had big 4th of July party. You're all hanging on it. You're all at the beach. You're all on an airplane. You're all going everywhere. You're all at a winery showing me the drinks. But you can't come to church? Dave Stone used to be the preacher at Southeast Louisville, and, and his wife said this week, incredible, I thought it was a great quote. She said, we've spent our whole lives trying to get unchurched people to church. Now we're trying to get church people to church. Uh, the world has changed. Our nation is in crisis mode right now. We're, we're in a worse spot than we were after 9-11, trust me. I, my gut tells me we're about to go under. I think there's going to be a divide so great that I don't think it'll ever go back to what it was. And God said in the Old Testament, if my people, that's us, that's God followers, that's Jesus lovers. Are you a Jesus lover? If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then he will hear and he will heal this land. That's what we need. I, I, I got to be honest, I don't see much of that. I just see division. I just see hatred. We're upset about the left. We're upset about the right. We need to run to Jesus Christ. We need to have a strong faith through all of this stuff. We don't need a fair-weathered faith when the sun is shining. We can praise the Lord. We don't need a foul-weathered faith when we just call on him when something bad goes wrong. We need to have a strong all weathered faith, whatever's going on, earthquake, pandemic, or the sun is, whatever it is, we need to have this strong faith. And I've got three points I want to share with you. Number one, faith doesn't shield us from suffering. I hope you recognize this. It doesn't mean we're immune. If you have faith, that's great. And uh, real faith doesn't mean you're not going to go through some pain. It says they faced jeers, they were flogged, they were put to death by the sword. I mean, it also says that the world was not even worthy of them. That means the world system was not even worthy of these people. They had such great faith. They were willing to lay down their lives for God. The world wasn't even worthy of them. They were a bunch of no names. We don't, we don't even know the names. I, I think one of them had to be Jeremiah. Jeremiah was thrown in prison for, for preaching the truth. The Talmud, it's not in the Bible, the Talmud said Isaiah was a prophet and he was preaching about the, that Jerusalem was going to fall and, and King Manasseh was so wicked that he chased them out of the city and Isaiah hid, the Talmud says that he, that he hid in a hollow tree and Manasseh found that tree and he sawed it in two and the Talmud says that Isaiah never cried out, he just continued to pray out to God through the entire ordeal, but he was sawed in two. There were many killed by the sword. That great wanderer in the desert, John the Baptist, he lost his head because of his faith, because of the things he preached. And that was just an example of thousands, and some say even millions, who have been so faithful to God, and yet they lost their life. My dad died in March I think it was the second week of quarantine, we played one of his old sermons uh, for online. And the, the title of the sermon is, Does God Always Come Through? It's one of my favorite sermons. He preached it three times here. And I heard it several times before we got here. But uh, the answer to that question is yes. Yes, yes, yes. I don't think he emphasized that enough in the sermon. But the answer is yes, God always comes through. But the problem is he doesn't always come through the way you think he should come through, the way you wish for, the way you think, the way you pray for. There's so much false gospel out there today. There's this thing on almost every channel on television called the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel. And it says basically this, that if you just have enough, if you just, if you, if you just have enough faith, you're going to be wealthy, and you're going to be healthy, and you're going to be happy, and everything's going to be wonderful, and you're going to have a mustache like mine. <laughs> that is all fake. That is a sham. That is a that is fake news. That is a false gospel. And some of these 
prosperity preachers go to other countries and they find out it doesn't work. Uganda and China and Iran and Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia doesn't work there. You know why? Because people are killed there even if they're found uh, in possession of the Bible. Their lives are taken. This isn't a prosperity gospel. It's basically a survival gospel. And we've, we in America, we've adopted a little bit of that. We don't embrace all of it, but we kind of feel like, you know what, if I have faith, God kind of owes me a little bit. Uh huh, yeah. I mean, doesn't the Bible say, whatever you ask for in my name, you'll receive it, right, 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 right? And so many of the things we pray for, it doesn't happen. I have people, they've asked me to pray for outdoor events, that they'll, it'll be good weather. I tell them I'm not in sales. <laughs> I mean, Jesus paid the price for you. He endured the cross. And some of us think because he did that and paid that price that we we will just follow him and, and he will be our good luck charm. And that's not what the Bible says. I've met people who have had loved ones who are terminally ill, a husband, a wife, and child And we got together and we prayed for that husband and we prayed for that wife and we prayed for that child. And many times that husband and that wife and that child, they died anyway. And I meet them years later and usually they have this spirit, this attitude, I don't want anything else to do with God, nothing. I'm so disappointed with God. It's like they bear a grudge because he didn't do what they asked him to do. Like faith is some sort of superstitious, magical spell. If you say the right words and you do the right little thing, you can make God act a certain way. You can't. It's sad to think that. But I know some of you have been hurt. You've been wounded. And I just want to encourage you. I want to implore you to come back to your relationship with your heavenly father and understand what faith really is. Because you've got to understand that even good, godly people of faith, they suffer They go through trials. All of our prayers are not going to be answered the way we think they ought to be answered. Suffering is a part of walking by faith. Peter wrote this to a persecuted church, 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? You don't get a lot of credit for that. You did something wrong. You deserve a little punishment. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. That's one of the few places in the entire Bible where it says you ought to follow in his steps in this way, that you ought to suffer because he suffered for you. He gave you the perfect example. He suffered, but he endured. He went through it. We suffer, we ought to endure. We shouldn't quit. We shouldn't give up. We shouldn't throw in the towel. We shouldn't say, I'm never reading the Bible again. I'm never going to pray again. I'm never going to church again. Some of us follow him. I just think we're a little, this culture of consumerism. that We we just think, I'm going to follow him because it'll be good for me. I'm going to follow him because something really, really good will happen if I do. If I follow God, maybe I'll be protected. Maybe, maybe I won't get sick. Something good will come out of it. I just, I just know that. We ought to follow Jesus because we have this little thing within us called belief, because we have this little thing called faith. We believe that he is God. He is God in the flesh We know that he went to heaven. We know that he died for us. We know that he did all of that on the cross. We know that one day he's coming back for us. And what he told us when he was here, he didn't ask us. He commanded us to have faith. He commanded us to follow him and to believe in him. Those of you that are suffering right now, it's not that I don't have any compassion. I do, I do, I do. Some of you are in the mixing bowl right now. 
But you, you need to know that faith doesn't fix every problem. But God does promise that he'll give you the grace so that you can endure it, that you can work your way through that problem. Whatever happens, he promises to give you that thing called grace. Paul said three times, Lord, take it away, take it away, take it away. God, please take it away. And you know what God said? God said, no, I'm not gonna take it away. But I will give you the grace that you need to to endure it. Number two in your notes, if you have it, faith endures the present pain for the future glory. You say, what are you talking about? (laughs) You're getting really scriptural here, preach. Well, I, I think it's talking about heaven. Whatever it is you're going through, I'm not, and again, I hope you don't think I'm trying to minimize it. I'm not. But the suffering, the pain that you're going through, that ought to be a small thing in the big picture because we're looking forward to our future, our future glory, our future home. The first word of verse 39, it says, these were all commended for their faith, not just the famous Abrahams and Isaacs and Jacobs. Everybody on this list, the the known names, they were commended for their faith. So the audience of one in heaven, the creator of the universe, he's up there and yay, Noah. You know, it's like a hero that receives a, a welcome and a commendation. Yay, Noah, you did so good. I love you so much. You did so great. Thank you so much. Abraham, you did great. Daniel, you did great. David, you did great. Isaac, Mo, you did great. Even the lesser names, Gideon and Jephthah, you did great. You did great. Even the no names, they were all commended for their faith. And yet the Bible says in that verse, one of the strangest things that's so bizarre, yet they did not receive the promise. What? They endured all this stuff. They went through all this and they didn't receive the promise. Herbert Lockler wrote a book. There are 8,000 promises in the Bible. And a lot of them received a lot of promises, but they didn't receive, these Old Testament saints did not receive the promise. You say, what is the promise? Well, the promise in a nutshell is Jesus Christ. They were promised that God was going to send a Messiah that he would set up a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, that he would rule the universe. And all these Old Testament saints, they were looking forward to that, but they never quite received it. But they believed it, and that's why they were saved. That's why they were people of faith. Moses never physically saw Jesus, but he believed in the promise of Jesus. Abraham never saw Jesus, but he believed in the promise of Jesus. Romans 4 says he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's done. You got faith. You're saved. You're going to heaven because you believed God. They saw it, but they didn't see all of it. They didn't know who he is. They didn't know what he would look like. They didn't know everything he was going to do. But we believe you, God. If you say it, we believe it. You're going to send someone that you're you're going to promise he's going to be the Messiah. And when they died, they died with faith. And that's why one day we're going to join them in heaven. That is the promise. Let me ask you. You know about the promise? I hope you do. I hope you've heard about the cross. I mean, we have so much more information than they had. They didn't have any of the details we had. They were looking forward to this vague thing. You're going to send a Messiah. You're going to, okay, okay. We believe it. We got all of this before our eyes. We know all the details. We got four different versions of, of, of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every time you read it, something new pops up. We know all about the cross. We know all about the resurrection. That's why we have a better opportunity to follow him. We ought to have more faith than those Old Testament saints had because we have so much more information. 
the people that were reading this letter back in the day, and even the people in the 21st century today, you're struggling with something, you're tempted to give in, you're tempted to compromise. This, this book, this, this hall of faith chapter is saying to you, don't do it. Stay in there, just keep on keeping on, just keep enduring, because what's coming around the corner, heaven, and all of the glory that's gonna be revealed in heaven is so much greater than your temporary struggle that you're facing right now. Paul didn't just have a thorn in the flesh either, by the way. The Bible says he was in a shipwreck, nearly died, nearly drowned. The Bible says he was stoned. I like to say rocked because stone has a different meaning today. They didn't take little pebbles and toss at him and just irritate him nearly to death. They get him cornered in somewhere and they take big rocks and they throw at him. And the Bible says they left him for dead. They thought there was no way he was ever going to take another breath. He was beaten with rods. He was in prison writing most of the books that he wrote. He was tortured in so many different ways. And yet he writes in Romans chapter 5, a couple of incredible verses. He says, not only so, but we also rejoice. We what? We rejoice. We rejoice because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. We know that one day he's coming back again. We know this. So we rejoice in the suffering that we're going through right now. He says in chapter eight, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Yeah, we're gonna suffer. But it's only part-time. It's only temporary. You line it up next to heaven. You line it up next to eternity. It's not even worth comparing. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, was a Catholic priest. And And he did something very bizarre. He started reading his Bible And he found some things in the Bible that he didn't really think that the Catholic Church was aligned with the Scripture, and it confused him, and he confronted the Catholic Church. And it didn't go very well, let me just tell you. He came to this conclusion that a a person ends up going to heaven because they kept the rituals not because they did all the sacraments, not because they did all the extra rules that were written, stand up, sit down, stand, and a hundred other things. He discovered you go to heaven because you have real, true, genuine faith. Faith alone. Faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, that's how you get to heaven. And he started a thing called the Reformation Movement. By the way, it changed the whole world. The whole world. And out of that movement came these things called solas. Sola scriptura, which means only. Only scripture. Wouldn't that be a pretty good rule? He came up with that. Sola fei means only faith. Sola gracia, only grace. Grace only. Sola Christo. Only Jesus. Sola Deo. All the glory goes to God. Not to a man on the stage. Not to a man in a robe. It goes to God. And the entire world was changed. By the way, they excommunicated him. They burned his books. They found him guilty of treason. He was in this kangaroo court. They burned part of his house down. He was a man on the run. Some people took him in, but can you imagine the pain that he went through, that he suffered? Everybody hated him. Everybody thought he was a false teacher and a heretic. Years later, he wrote those words that became one of our old hymns. A mighty fortress is our God. He said, let the goods and kindred go. Let it go. This mortal life also This body they may kill, but God's truth 
abideth still, and his kingdom is forever and ever and ever. You can burn my books, you can burn my house, you can burn my body, but you know what? His truth endures forever. And friend, whatever you're going through today, I just want you to keep your eyes on the prize. I want you to realize we're only down here for a short, short time. And whatever you're going through, I, I, I get it. I, I, I'm not trying to not have any compassion for you, but I just want you to know that it's not even worthy to be compared to the glory that you're one day going to experience in heaven. I close with this, and I, this is bizarre to me. The Faith Hall of Fame won't be complete until we join them, okay? Look at verse 40, the last verse. It says, God had planned something better for us so that only together with us, this is bizarre. I mean, I, I, this, I was a head scratcher. Only to better with us would they be made perfect. What? What are you gonna tell me that we're gonna somehow help Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? How, how is that possible? These Old Testament saints, they were looking forward to the Messiah. They didn't even know his name. We have something so much better. We know his name is Jesus. We can look back at the cross. We can look back at the promised one. We have it all before us. We know that he died and went to heaven. We know he's coming back again. We have such a better revelation than any of those Old Testament saints had. That's why God is saying he had something better planned for us. That's why our faith ought to be charged up. We ought to be enthused. We ought to have a ton more faith than those Old Testament saints. In fact, the entire book of Hebrews, the, really the key word in the whole book is the word better. That's what, that's what Hebrews is telling us. Jesus is saying, the Bible is saying that everything is better with Jesus. Chapter one, he's better than the angels. Two, he's better than the prophet. Chapter three, he's better than Moses. Chapter four, he gives us a better Sabbath. Chapter five, he's better than the high priest. Chapter six, he's better than Abraham. Chapter seven, he's better than Melchizedek. Chapter eight, he gives us a better covenant. Chapter nine, he gives us a better sacrifice. And chapter 10, he gives us better security. And chapter 11, he says, I'm gonna give you a better home. I'm going to give you a better country. I'm going to give you a better land. I'm going to give you a place called heaven forever and ever and ever. And so I have there at the bottom of your notes, if you don't mind filling it in, everything about Jesus is so much. You can do better. <laughs> everything about Jesus is so much. Better. One more time. Everything about Jesus is so much. Better. Oh. It is so much better, so much better. You better believe it. You better write it down. Everything with him is better. I feel better even having said it three times. But there's a strange part in there. They'll not be made perfect without us. I just think, man, Abraham needs me. <laughs> I, I don't get it. Moses, Joseph, you're saying he's, he's not complete until we're there? I, I don't really get it. And I guess the best way after having thought about it some time that I could describe it is if you could just picture a greatest, the greatest Thanksgiving banquet you've ever had in your life with all of your family, all the family members, grandpa and grandma and the and the four sons and the four daughter-in-laws and all the, all the grandkids, they're all there. Everyone's there at the biggest table, all the nicest chairs, the, all the, the food is on, everything is ready. And yet one of the sons calls. And he says, Dad, we're stuck in traffic. We're not gonna be there for a while. We're, we're, we're 15, maybe 20 minutes before we get there. I'm sorry. And the dad says, son, listen, you just be careful. You take your time. We aren't about to start without you. And they're waiting. The meal is all prepared. The excitement is building. But nobody's sitting down. Nobody's going to jump in and start eating until they get there. They're going to wait until the family comes. 
And when they get there, they'll sit down and their joy will be complete and they'll begin eating and they'll have the fellowship that they've never had in their lives. And I wanna tell you that heaven, heaven is awesome, but I gotta tell you, it's not full right now. The Bible says there's going to be a marriage supper of the lamb one day. And I got a feeling right now there's, there's food all over that table. There's people standing all around it, all the saints, all the famous ones, all the no names. They're all gathered around, but you know what they're saying? Hey, don't worry, don't worry. We're not about to start eating until you get here. And when you get here, that's when the real fellowship is going to begin. Friend, heaven is waiting for you. In God's time, the circle will be complete. In God's time, they, the Bible says, they will be complete when we get there. Are we gonna suffer while we're down here from time to time? Absolutely. I I got kind of this weird feeling that we're probably gonna suffer more as time goes on just because of stuff going on in the world. But I I, I don't know that. But the point is, we're here for a short time. And you know your real purpose down here is not just to enjoy every day and just take it all in. Your your purpose is to really take that gospel that you know and to share it with somebody before you leave this place so you can get one more person sitting at that table up in heaven. That's really the only reason we're down here. I hope you have enough faith to believe that. I, we had one of our precious saints again this week die, Diana Smith. She used to sit right over here. She was so good to me, so kind to me. Just a saint. I mean, just a saint. She had such incredible faith. I loved her so very, very much. She was a faithful, faithful, faithful woman. And I have zero doubt that she is in the arms of of her Lord and Savior right now. I I know that. I I just know that. Friend, God has a better place for us. God has a better home for us. It's called heaven. And that's why, listen, in spite of all my ranting and raving, I really believe, in spite of all the pain that you might be going through, in spite of the turmoil, the loss of somebody's life, the loss of income, whatever it is, endure it. And take that gospel and take that good news and share it with somebody before you leave this place. Increase heaven's borders. I've told before about the five missionaries who were taking the gospel to Ecuador, the Harani tribe. And they, when they arrived, they, this plane was ferried across this body of water and it got to the beach. And This tribe was totally godless at the time. And they literally murdered all five of these missionaries with spears and machetes. 65 years ago, this happened. 65 years ago. Just think of the difference today. It was, it was on the front page of several magazines. It, was on the, it made the front page of Life magazine. That wouldn't happen today. Just, that wouldn't even be news today. The pilot of the plane, his name was Nate Saint. A little ironic. They were all murdered quickly. Nate Saint had a son named Steve Saint. He was about five years of age. But he grew up and he went back to that tribe and shared the gospel. And most of that tribe, several generations of that tribe, they're all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Nate, his son, Steve, one time he was talking with one of the men who killed his father. And he, he, he discovered some things that just kind of blew his mind. All five of those missionaries had pistols on them. All five of them had, and not one bullet was fired, not one. And this troubled the son, this troubled Steve. He, he just kept thinking they didn't have to die, they didn't have to die. But then he realized the reasons the missionaries didn't shoot these attacking 
tribal members. Why? Because they knew if they were killed by these native tribe members, they knew they would go to heaven. And they knew if they pulled those guns and shot them, that they would not go to heaven. And they were willing and ready to die for Jesus. One of those famous missionaries was Jim Elliot, who wrote in his diary, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I got to tell you, friends, all those famous people in this hall of faith, all of the lesser names in the hall of faith, all of the no names that we read about in the hall of faith, and those five missionaries they are in that hall of faith. And one of these days, if you endure whatever it is God has put in your way or allowed to be put in your way, you are going to be in that hall of faith with them. <laughs> They're going to be complete and we're going to be complete and we're going to have all of eternity to have the greatest banquet, the greatest feast, the greatest festival, the greatest praise time, the greatest fellowship in the history. You can't, your mind can't even picture it. So whatever it is you're going through, God will give you the grace to get through it. Just keep on pressing on, keep on pressing on. Our great band is gonna sing for us and I'd like for you to stand right now and if you have a decision to make, we're not asking you to step forward again. We're asking you maybe to text Jesus to the number on the screen. We'll get with you in the next uh, 24 hours. Also, uh, there will be people in the lobby. If you wanna talk to them, they should be ready and present and wearing a lanyard. You should be able to identify them. Just, just walk up to them and say, hey, I wanna make a decision. This is what's on my heart. They will take that and help you in any and every way they can. I thank you. I love you for listening to me go on and on. I'll see you next week. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Thank you for a great message as well.
Thanks, everyone. We're going to get you out of here in one minute. We are going to close our service with a baptism, and we want to celebrate that. So when they come up out of that water, let's all celebrate that, and then you can be dismissed after that. Uh, thank you for being here this weekend. Watch it online. Uh, on your way out, as a reminder, you can grab one of those baby bottles. Um, you can also get some of your questions answered about Fresno Christian. Uh, in addition to that, you've got the connection cards. For those of you that are physically here on campus, you can place those in the, the, the boxes on the way out, along with your tithes and your offerings. If you have any spiritual decisions, that you'd like prayer for today. Our pastors will be in the lobby. We'd love to pray for you. If you're a first or second time guest, we have a gift for you as our way of saying thanks for being here this weekend. You can head outside um, and you look just to your left. You'll know, notice there's a guest uh, um, tent there and we'd love to just meet you, greet you, answer any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, and also, we're just thankful that you're here. Those of you that are here physically, um, we're looking forward to having maybe even more of you join us this next week. And so with that said, um, it's exciting. We believe baptism is a really important part of becoming an obedient follower of Jesus Christ. And when we come out of that water, we're just saying yes to Jesus. We're being obedient to that. So let's celebrate life change at this time. If you would, roll the video. Well, hey, church, thank you for sticking around. We have one baptism to celebrate right now. This is our brother, Darren. Darren, I got a question for you. Is it your desire today to declare Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Awesome, Darren. Accepting. That's awesome, man. Repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. Darren, it's based on that profession of your faith that I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Congratulations, brother. That's awesome. Thank you, brother. Thank you guys for sticking around. Have a great week. We will pray.